in Hiroshima, Japan, and today I am talking with Real in Japan in Nagoya. Is that Nagoya. right? Nagoya. Yeah, awesome. Welcome, I, everyone. Thank you for watching. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. I think you are the first guest from Nagoya. I don't think we've had anybody else. That's not many people in Nagoya, but if you start, I have a lot of people I can present you. <laughs> that will be oh, wonderful. super happy to be there. Too. Yeah. Good, good. And that's, then that's today, an honor to be with you today. Oh yeah, you're you're representing Nagoya. Thank you so much. Um, but you're also <laughs> representing uh, like a sustainable travel insights. So you have a background in studying tourism and travel and sustainability, but you're also passionate about kimono. And we're going to talk a little bit about Nagoya. So we got a lot of different things to talk about today. Thank you so much for joining. Hope one hour will be enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can we can always do a follow up in a few months' time if we have too much to talk about. So I had the That's chance. Useful. Yeah, I had the chance to meet you because I did a collaboration with Attractive Japan, and it's a really great uh, travel company that really focuses on a lot of like off the beaten track experiences. Um, what can you tell us a little bit about like the philosophy for your travel company? Um, yeah. So my company is called Tiki Branding Yukin Kyushu and the um, uh, name of it in English is the Regional Branding uh, Institute. And they're um, operating a website called Attractive Japan, where we sell adventure and experience tourism in Japan. But the main focus of the company is not the end, the selling product. It's much more about uh, going into uh, the cities and also the rural areas and find places that would be interesting for foreigners, but not only if, like would be interesting in develop like for development and tourism development, but we are trying to stay on a sustainable side, which means that what we do is not we are finding a place, finding a guide, and then just send loads of people there. We are most uh, mostly trying to find local people who wants to operate tours or local artisans who wants to show their arts and crafts to the world. And we are training them to operate their own tours. And then when that is done, when they know how to um, you know, handle reservation and how to make the tour, and we are going to all the phases of what do a European like in terms of tourism? What do Chinese like in terms of tourism? And so on, trying to find the right target to them. When that is done, we are selling the experience on attractivejapan.com. Yeah, that's great. So that's a... Um, all, 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 how do you say that? Like a uh, hundred percent from finding the artisan to the end of the selling project and also the after sales because we are accompanying them in the reservation process. So we are with them from the beginning to the end, which is not the end, which is good because we are talking about sustainability. So, <laughs> yeah. well, I, I have uh, studied tourism in the sustainability focus. And I, when I worked with Attractive Japan, the company, I was really impressed, even from the website information about even talking about we want to make sure that the local people have a decent quality of life as well as tourists. And I think even on this really basic level, which kind of everybody should be talking about, it's still kind of new in Japan. Have you found that as well? Like with this basic level of sustainability talk about balancing people, planet profits is, is still kind of unheard of. In a lot I of think it, the main reason is that uh, mass tourism has only arrived in Japan a few years ago. Um, if you are looking for the, 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 the numbers of the tourism increase um, in the recent years, you can see that um, after the 20s, the two like the 2000s, and from 2010, the numbers are increasing drastically every year. And so Japan has only 
started to face masterism related problems uh, very recently. And that is, I think, one of the reasons why so far tourism was only seen as something that could generate revenue and no side effects. And also in the meantime, in a lot of different countries in the world, we have starting not to see the side effect because so, so in some countries have seen the side effects of masterism for many, many years already. But the sustainability and, you know, the mage caused by tourism has gained um you know voices and i think a lot more people are talking about that in japan and that's why the idea is still fairly new um you know like i come from france and france is uh, one of the biggest uh touristic country in the world and we have a whole ministry dedicated to tourism uh not in japan <laughs> so there's still so many um, how do you see that? Eyes to be opened, uh, that need to be opened. And we have to be careful in the way you do that because as every transformation, each time you start to be aggressive or violent, people just shut their eyes to you. And so even though the concept is fairly seems fairly new in Japan, there are people trying to promote this kind of tourism and this kind of value for a very long time already. And I mean, you have interviewed a lot of people like that in your podcast already, but yes, the concept, the concept is new and a lot of people have, are just starting to hear about the plastic pollution or they're just starting to hear about, you know, um, no, uh, how do you get that? Zero déchet, what's the name? What's the word in English? Like, you know, less, uh, rubbish, <laughs> uh -huh. yeah, waste <laughs> or organic. Waste. Oh yes, but, yeah, less yeah. waste, zero waste. That's the name. But uh, a lot so, of things. I'm so happy to see that you guys are doing is supporting local artisans, like you said, uh, supporting small businesses. Uh, it's not only interesting for visitors to to visit how show you and learn how show you is made or how the noodles are made, like I'm showing in the pictures or visit a small izakaya on a back street instead of all the mass tourism typical attractions of the tokyo tower uh the temples in kyoto right all the major most crowded attractions i think now japan's tourism industry has matured a little bit hopefully the smaller more meaningful uh, slow travel things that you guys are promoting. Hopefully that has a lot more appeal now to, of course, not mass tourism. We still need the mass tourism um, to go to the mass tourism places, but a lot more people, smaller groups are, are more interested in kind of slow travel, more meaningful travel. Are you finding this? Um, yes, actually, mass tourism is not only evil. Um, masterism also has some interesting sites. The thing that you need, that people need to understand is that for first travel in Japan, going to Tokyo and Kyoto, what we call the Golden Road, is not bad. I mean, most of the tourists going to France for the first time in their life, they will go to Paris, they will go to Champs Elysees. If they're Japanese, they will go to Mont Saint Michel and, and you know, they will go back to their country. Uh, and, and I think it's the same for pretty much everyone going in France for the first time. So that's the same for Japan, especially for people coming from, from very f far. However, what we can see in the trends is that, for example, people coming from Asia, on 10 people coming to Japan, six of them are repeaters, which means that it's the second, third, or so for some people, the 10th time they're coming to Japan. And even if for Europe, the, the rate is lower because of the distance, obviously it's a lot uh, far, but it's a lot further and it takes a lot more money. Still, depending on some countries, and for example, for French people, five people out of 10 are repeaters. And so those people and me included, when, I, when they, co they go for Japan for the first time, there are some boxes they want to tick. And this goes by Tokyo Asakusa and Harajuku and Kyoto and Gion and all these kind of uh, places. But when you come down the second time or the third time, now you're not afraid anymore because you know where you go. 
And a lot, a big problem of small areas and remote areas are the language. When you know to age, when you go to any country in Europe, because the writing system is alphabet, the Latin alphabet, even if you cannot read it or understand, you can still type it on your phone by yourself and look and look what it is. But when it's written in kanji, you don't even ha know how to write them on your phone, right? Actually, there's a lot of apps for this, but that is a huge barrier. Because also no one in the people, if you go outside of the road, the buses, routes and everything, it's all in Japanese and, and a lot of expats there <laughs> still getting lost because it's, it's not easy to find your way out. So a lot of people are demanding uh, experiences outside of the Golden Road and the beaten path. But it is very difficult because uh, if uh, people in, I mean, are aware of what the tourism um, uh, keywords are right now, everywhere you go, it's written off the beaten path or deep Japan, unknown Japan, mysterious Japan. And everybody says that. And it's written everywhere. And sometimes it's also written to places that everybody knows. Uh, <laughs> and that is uh, very difficult for people who are truly looking for um, experience that feel, that, I mean, I would feel their needs because everybody needs different. But I think that the most important in sustainable tourism is to understand that even if you're a tourist from a country, you have hobbies, you have things you like and things you don't like, and there are things you need and you don't need. And a big part of sustainable tourism is to um, divide the flow of tourists to many, many places, depending on their interests, deep interests, and on the capacity of each places. And a very interesting word and very, um, that's a new word, but it's called right sizing the needs uh, from the right size. When you create some a tourist, uh, touristic content somewhere, asking directly the people, how many people do you want to come? How much can you handle? How much is too much? And that's a big, big part of what sustainable tourism is. Is, um, is it doesn't? It, I mean, it's not sustainable if it has it enters in conflict with people living there, with the local, with people um, that are working, commuting every day. Uh, you know, like raising their kids and going to the supermarket and trying to park their car or bicycle. You know, like for people living in Kyoto, a lot of people are not using bicycles anymore because there's no way to park them. And when you park your bicycle, and uh, I, I know what I'm talking about, at some place that is not, uh, you know, dedicated for this, chances are if you're next to Gion and stuff that in 30 minutes time, your bicycle is removed. Yeah. Without even any notice, because it's 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 horrible. Whereas really, in terms yeah. of in terms of the quality of experience, if there were less cars and more walking areas without cars or bicycles, pedestrianized areas, it would be a lot better experience. Uh, one of the yes. things I suggested, I just visited Tomonoura in Hiroshima last week. And it's a, a famous, I love that place. It's a beautiful fishing town, fishing village. And but they the have cars. these tiny, tiny streets. And people are walking on the street and there's just enough room for, for people walking. But they still allow people to drive down because it's it's what they've always done. It's always been a road. So one and of because my they're suggestions, living there. Yeah, but one of my suggestions would be during the peak time, 10 until 4, nobody drives down. And everybody can do their business before or after on the busy days. Or maybe just local traffic, right? But there are ways to kind of adjust these things to make quality of life for local people as well as visitors, right? The because only solution crazy. you can get to have people, local people, to accept this kind of restriction because to them it's only restriction you are only taking out their freedom when you do so for tourism the only solution is to show them how tourism can be beneficial for them yeah. and if they understand what tourism can bring to them 
and if tourism has more positive impacts than negative impacts, then you can ask them on some restriction on their way of life. Yeah. The big problem with tourism is, especially in Japan, is that they only have bad examples of it. But I, I, I was so inspired by some of the young shopkeepers taking over the old buildings and remodeling and not using plastic. And there were so many fantastic innovations and new styles of, of tourism. And they have their own products. It's just a fantastic yeah. place. So it really inspired me that some rural areas, they can do it. They can, yes. they can open up to tourism, get the income, and have a balance. So that, that was really wonderful to see. Uh, Louise has joined from New Zealand. New, Louise is also a tour guide on HAPS. Thank you so much, Louise, for joining. Thank you, Louise. Um, one thing I, I really want to touch on, you are so passionate about kimono. Let's yeah. talk about your love of kimono, because I love all these photos that I want to show. Um, I think my passion for traditional clothing comes from my father. We used to do historical reenactment in France um, for all my childhood. It was not about French history, it was about American history and um, most of all the arrival of French colonials in uh, Quebec and all this, uh, you know, remotely, um, pastly French area that is not, not French anymore. But um, so we were, you know, making our own um, crafted costume based on historical uh, paintings and drawings and what we could see in different museums. And it was really a, a nice way to try to understand better the culture. Um, and I think I got that, you know, love for a traditional costume as a part of a culture and what it represents and what it shows also about, you know, the habits of people who are living into this clothing. And when I arrived in Japan, my first travel, um, um, I remember going to a friend in Kyoto and she bring me to a shop to buy my first yukata. So for those who do not really know Japan, um, yukata is a cotton kimono that is uh, where only one layer in summer. So it's um, usually wear, worn now by people during festivals or young couples doing like a yukata date and stuff. Um, and so I started there. And I had this yukata for many, many years until I passed it to a friend because I um, gained some weight. It was not my size anymore. <laughs> And then I went back to Japan, bought some new yukatas, and I had two or three of them. And any occasion was good for me, you know, to take my yukata out and go to a local festival and enjoy with my friends. And someday a friend of mine was like, okay, we need your help on the local festival event. Um, because we need some English staff. Would you like to volunteer? Uh, I will bring some of my kimono. So if you want to try them on, I was like, oh my God, you know, kimono. I had such a big image of kimono, like, very traditional and so many layers and so complicated and and uh, I was like okay but my friend she knows it so you know sh maybe she will show me right stuff and uh, it was super fun actually <laughs> and it looked already alike a lot about uh, to the yukata I was used to in so many basic uh, tricks and so I just loved it, level up my game uh, <laughs> And she also showed me where to buy really cheap kimono in, in Nagoya because there's a lot of uh, vintage clothing store. In Japanese, we said furugi, furugiya. And there's a lot of uh, old kimono uh, shops in Nagoya. And actually, if you are lucky and you get the right find, you can have the whole kimono set with all the layers and stuff for less than a, uh, ichimayan. So it's... 100 euros, something like that, uh, probably a 100 of dollars or like approaching, which is absolutely not expensive. Um, yeah. And very reasonable, isn't it? Yes, and I mean, I, because you have many layers going on and many, yeah. you know, belts and stuff. And I love the way that you wear it. I love how you mix and match. I love how sometimes you wear Western clothing or, you know, like a belt, Western style belt on top of the obi. It's just gorgeous. Where do you get your ideas? Instagram. 
uh, <laughs> I, I'm a big Instagrammer and I have met a lot of uh, very interesting people in Instagram thanks to kimono. There's a lot of uh, uh, kimono lovers all around the world, actually. And what I discovered is that kimono doesn't always have to be formal because at some point in time, people were using kimono as an everyday outfit. They, there was nothing, nothing else. And when you study a little bit of kimono history, and I am not the one who's studying, um, I am reading accounts of people who are studying, <laughs> uh, like in kimono or Billy Yam. Um, and those uh, people you just know showing how kimono has changed and evolved in different eras, uh, depending on different needs. And then you realize that in Taisho era, so during the 20s in, in, in Japan, um, a lot of foreigner web st uh, style were also used with kimono. So girls would have, you know, different hairstyle and different hearts just because it was the fashion, but still on their family kimono. And that's where you understand that actually, you know, it should be modernized. It's okay to write it at formal because some occasion, uh, really, really, I mean, if you wear kimono at some occasion, you better do it right. But it doesn't have to be always serious. And something else is that more and more young people do, even Japanese, do think kimono is it's uh, is a pain to wear because it's difficult. And, you know, it's the family kimono, so it, has, it carries a lot of history and it's very serious. And so a lot of young people, they don't want to wear kimono anymore because it's only associated, associated to very formal and boring kind of stuff <laughs> not everyone sorry boring is a huge word however um a lot of uh grandmothers and, and elderly people in the area i used to live in they are very sad because their daughters don't want their kimono anymore and they have no idea what to do with them because it costs a lot of money some of them has been handmade and you know m most of them when it is in a, in a family it's been tailor made and if it's not stored probably it goes bad very quickly and if no one nobody wears it they, they are not going to keep them forever and some of them just throw them away wow that's so sad that is super <laughs> sad and uh, i was lucky enough to be known in the last area that I was living in as a kimono lover and um, grandma who used to have the same body tap as me just gave me her entire collection. Wow, um, amazing. It was incredible. I cried so much. <laughs> and I, I saw that you were also uh, repairing or sewing sometimes. So uh, yeah. one, one of your posts on Instagram, you were talking about finding a beautiful vintage kimono, but it had some damage. So you took it home and you were reusing the beautiful material kind of in a new way. That's fantastic. Um, and it's fabric. At the end of the day, it's fabric. And sometimes they're too damaged to be um, used that way. But it then, you know, it has a history. And even more when it's made of silk, silk, you know, is a living material. It's been made from silkworms. And you need to kill many, many silkworms to make a kimono. So I think it's important to think about that. And just throwing it away, it's super sad. And sometimes you can, you know, just use some parts to make something else. A lot of people are making, you know, skirts or bags. Um, when you, I think you can look for the a hashtag uh, kimono remake uh, on Instagram because you will find a lot of things. Or, you know, um, my biggest problem with kimono is my body size. I love my body, but it's not the Japanese size. <laughs> And it's very difficult to find kimono my size. So sometimes trying to use kimono in another way is a way to wear things that would be thrown away otherwise. Yeah. So, yeah. And all those things mean sometimes, you know, that you need to repair as you can. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's uses some, I think, innovation. And 
the ideas that you bring from your past and then wearing kimono in kind of a new way or even with different accessories. I, it's just it's so refreshing because I've lived in Japan so long that for me, I feel kind of scared to wear kimono the right way, yeah. you know, and talking to people like you or seeing your pictures, kimono Sheila, paprika girl, Stasia. Oh, so, those are incredible. So many people in the series who are kind of putting a new light on kimono fashion for me and mm. so many of their fans. So it's so wonderful to see kind of kimono in a new way and in a modern use, like in yeah. use, not just a in the past kind of fashion. I love it. Yeah, I mean, actually there's there are a lot of Japanese people who are also wearing kimono as a fashion item. Actually, you can find them a lot. However, I think that as foreigners, we kind of allow them to take some liber some freedom with them because they are Japanese. And so it's not in any way cultural appropriation, but the line is very difficult to make when you're foreigners. And I know that some French girl, um, I know on, where was it, on Instagram, she was posing in her wedding kimono with her husband. And she got people angry at her because it was cultural appropriation. Well, you know, she's been living in Japan for a very long time and her husband is Japanese and it was a photo shoot that is very traditional for her family. And I think a lot of people are afraid of haters, to, that really simply said. Um, and so as soon as you're, you know, saying, all right, it's my life, it's okay, um, you get a lot more exposure. Um, but I know a lot of people actually, and even the Japanese friends that are eager to wear their kimono differently. You can sometimes spot in them uh, people with jean kimono, like jean fabric kimono. I want them. I want. I want one myself. They're so cool. Like um, denim. Yeah. Denim. Yes. Denim kimono are wow. <laughs> yeah. Saki, who was uh, in the series, a Japanese woman who was living in Europe, and she was wearing kimono in Europe. Uh, when she was there and she was talking about uh, people telling her about cultural appropriation and she was saying, I've never met a Japanese person who is unhappy to see people yeah. in kimono, like, please wear it. Yes, but that, you got the point. On, on the other hand, sometimes she does see people wearing it in a different way and she thinks, I just hope they are doing that knowing the traditional way. Yeah, like I hope they understand the traditional way and then choose to change it. So it is an interesting discussion, isn't it? But that it is because if she think, uh, I hope they understand. It's because probably in their way of doing so, it looks like they don't understand. Right. Yeah. Um. And and that is very difficult because where is the line of uh, I understand enough to be playing by by the rule or to be to break the rule because you know myself I've never been to a kimono school I've never been taught by a kimono teacher um I'm just you know watching tutorials on the internet and, and try to ask my friends when I have some that are a little bit more knowledgeable as me and me with kimono but actually I am absolutely not a kimono expert and I might do some a lot of things wrong but you're absolutely right. I have never met a Japanese criticizing me uh, for wearing a kimono. Instead of that, I tend to go to every conference and seminar I have. I try to wear a kimono or some kimono items over my uh, suits. And my clients love it. <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, it's. I think it's like you said before, there's a lot of people, elderly people who have these beautiful kimonos and they have nobody to give it to. They don't know who would be interested. So I think for, for any of them to see Westerners wearing kimono, they feel hope that maybe kimono culture will survive in yes. the future, right? And that's exactly, I think, uh, when we go back to the idea of what we're doing at Attractive Japan of sustainable tourism is that um, thanks to tourism, something that was were bound to um, be extinguished could survive. And uh, at some point in Japan, there was a huge debate on um, young foreigners entering the sorry, entering the, um, 
the workshops of artisans and learn with the artisans how they do and then become specialists there themselves. And Japan was like, should we let foreigners learn the Japanese way? Um, but at some point, you know, no, no other Japanese want to do it. So if no one wants to do it, it's going to disappear. So and, and you had the insight of a craftsman saying, whoever it is, as long as they put the effort in it, as long as they are willing to learn, I don't care where they're from, because what I have been taught and what has been continuing from generation has to continue. And a phrase that I really do love and I say often in my seminars is, I think the key for something not to change is that something, sometimes in order not to change, things have to change. And if the way you've been doing it so far is dooming your activity to the end, maybe you should change what, how you'd be doing to make it sure that it continues. And that's a huge part of what I'm trying to emphasize when doing sustainable tourism is that something are that bound to change, something are not, but you need to understand every aspect of what it means. Um, I know that in traditional tourism, usually we count um, the impact of tourism in a destination by the number of nights and the overall, you know, like turnaround. But the problem with sustainable tourism is that people will be sleeping in a lot of different places. Some will be Airbnbs, some will be, you know, free places, some will be hotels and stuff. And a lot of uh, places, it's very difficult to analyze where the money goes. Um, but actually, the, 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 the end of it is that the money goes everywhere and not only on the resort hotel by the sea. Yeah. And the idea of sustainable tourism is that people that come to see this craftsman, they're going to eat at the local restaurant and then going to go to the local uh, hot spring and they're going to enjoy some time at the beach and maybe rent bicycles and, you know, buy some souvenirs and, you know, and everybody will choose where to invest depending on their needs. Yeah. But it also means that it's more difficult to control people and more difficult to make them do what you want them to do. It's it's a, always a difficult balance, isn't it, to find yes. what what are the interests of the tourists, but often the tourists don't know what is really available, and you know what is so interesting you want to introduce to them, but you know they might not choose it. It's yeah. it's a difficult balance, right? Yes, and that for that research is mandatory. You need to know who can come and how they can come. And for example, in the kimono, um, we are right now, we do have like a content in Nagoya to rent a kimono. And a lot of people are like, but yeah, we can rent a kimono and take pictures in Kyoto. So why the hell would we go to Nagoya? <laughs> and I absolutely do understand yeah. uh, that point of view. But, but some maybe, people, yeah. maybe like, um, like you're showing in one of these photos, so wearing kimono and making Japanese sweets like wagashi. Yeah. So doing something in kimono, which for me is kind of, it's more meaningful and it's, it's more fun and you can take nice photos. It's not just wearing kimono and taking a photo and that's it. Wearing kimono, visiting a beautiful shrine, going to a garden, making traditional sweets, having tea ceremony, you know, doing something while you're wearing kimono is just awesome. Yeah. Love it. Actually, that picture was taken in Tokyo. <laughs> well, you can have great experiences anywhere. And, yes. you know, we have to have a variety of good experiences in Tokyo because that's where everybody goes, right? Vari variety is the word. Um, you need to have contents to cater to every need and not only you can, there would never be one content to cater to all need. It's like free size clothing. It actually is the size of no one and absolutely not my size. <laughs> um, so it's easier to measure the turnover when you only have one product that you sell to everyone for sure. But the customer satisfaction and the local people satisfaction will be lowered the more you have people the less the more difficult it is to cater for everyone um 
as an example, I used to work in a guest house for two years um, and we had 48 beds. And some people, you know, they just wanted somewhere uh, cheap and close by the station to stay. So they would arrive at 11 at night and they would leave at six or seven the next morning. And we had never, we would, didn't have time to talk with them, to interact with them and to make sure that their stay was going great. And at the end, we would get awful comments on uh, online, you know, like, oh, my God, the shower was a little dirty and, you know, there was uh, something and blah, blah, blah. It was like it was very frustrating because we didn't have time to take care of that client. And if the client is unhappy, it's just because we were so focusing on people arriving, you know, earlier they wanted to engage with us or people staying for the breakfast that wanted to engage with us. It's very difficult when you have too many people. It's impossible to make everybody happy which you know it's it goes for everything so one question i also ask a lot to the craftsmen when i'm creating content with them is what type of people do you want to see here what type of client do you want to come what type of client do you really don't want to come and how many people and how and i'm asking all those questions to make sure that the people that i will send to them are you know it's like it's like matching it's like love matching you know making sure that um the client's needs and the, the everybody's needs will be you know answered but it means a lot of work and it means that you have to have so many contents but there's also something we are in an era when you can find anything on the internet and what i'm doing i absolutely not the the only one my company is absolutely not the only one on the market and i think what's interesting is that every customer can choose a company that fits with their vision and that fits with their needs so i don't want to cater for everyone <laughs> it's impossible and uh, i won't be happy However, if we can find the clients that do like, you know, our vision and the way we are doing things, then I will be more than happy to have that customers and to present them to my uh, very dear little uh, craftsmen in the mountains. Because then I know that at the end of the experience, I will get a message from the client saying that was awesome. But I will also have a message from the craftsman saying, oh, my God, that client. Uh, we couldn't finish in three hours because it was so fun that we had a whole day. I want to hear that from every single of my clients. Yeah. And I think Attractive Japan vision works that way. That's awesome. I uh, showed you the tatami making experience yeah. a little bit. What a fun activity. And Louise has given us a super heart. Thank you so much. Louise. Thank you, That's Louise. Awesome. And uh, Blinky Bill has made a comment, the age of judgment. Yes, I think, yeah. uh, especially with so many people being online so often, we've got a lot more judginess going on, maybe. Yeah. I mean, that that's normal. It's a lot easier to give your advice, you, to give your opinion. Um, and the, the, the thing the most difficult is that um but that's just that that's social that's social that's not that's how the social media works um it's you know you need validation it's place playing on your need of validation and so if you have someone saying something wrong then you will instantly start um you know asking your whole life oh my god am i right for this society and am i doing the right thing and i think the most complicated thing is um my instagram is real in japan you can uh yeah sorry <laughs> um it's this needing a validation uh, is root rotting a lot of people relationships. I think um, I don't know if in the in the American culture the image I have of it is more people you know being proud of who they are and how they are and they don't care if uh, uh, other people do not agree with that. As a French, I don't know if it's a cultural thing. Um, I, mean, I would say I'm half French, half Japanese in the heart, but needing the validation, seeking the validation of others uh, has been at some point in my life very, very big to the point that I will try to change myself to please people around me thinking that I might not survive if I was not doing so. Um, 
and he led me on a very, very dangerous path. But uh, mm -hmm. I'm, I, you know, yeah. I, I think that's a pretty common thing, no matter where you are in the world, for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's always difficult. And I think it's it's very easy to take criticism to heart. And it's really hard to come back from. Um, I want to switch just a little bit. Yeah. Can you tell us about this beautiful lantern festival? Is it in Nagoya? So that's uh, which festival? Of it actually, uh, Nagoya region is well known for floats, so festival floats, um, and um, most of them have. So right now on the picture you cannot see it, but they will have mechani mechanical dolls made of wood. They are called karakuri ningyo. So karakuri is the word for angry, like you know this kind of like. Uh, <laughs> Like a mechanics interlocking, yeah, like interlocking gear. wheels, gear, uh -huh. gear kind of uh -huh. stuff. Yeah, and yeah. ningyo in Japanese means a uh, puppet. Like, mm -hmm. so there's a very very long history of um, wood mechanics uh, in Aichi Prefecture, and um, also a lot of festival with lanterns on it. And I think in a few videos that you've shown. Uh, so I think this is a festival from Shinmeiji. So right next uh, Nagoya Station, it's a very very small temple. Uh, only local go to this. Uh, this despite being right behind Nagoya Station once a year. But you will find actually a lot of lanterns festival in Aichi. Um, the most well known are the Tsushima Lantern Festival. I've never been myself, but it's very close by my place. So. Uh, hopefully this year the coronavirus thing will not make it stop. And the second one is the Inuyama uh, Lantern Festival. And the In Inuyama Festival, northern Nagoya, uh, is definitely worth seeing. So they are putting a lot of uh, lanterns uh, on floats. And the floats, depending on the area or... Um, I mean, in Tokyo, for example, the floats are called Mikoshi. And they're held on people's shoulder. They're very heavy. But because the floats in Aichi are even more heavy because you have three floors, which music players on the first floor, then people watching, uh, um, sorry, puppet masters on the second floor and puppets on the third floor, they're very high and so very heavy. And so they're on wheels. And they are called dashi because you people will not uh, lift them on their shoulder. They will pull them with ropes wow. but because they're so heavy one of the high tension point is when they have to make u-turn to go back on the other way and those u-turn are not made peacefully and slowly oh. they're made you know like uh right? it's it's super tension and high I tension know. and some of them they're turning and turning and at the end because of the weight of this you can actually find <laughs> cracks in the asphalt <laughs> Wow! <That's laughs> at some amazing. point yeah so that's, it's very it's very cool to see that's true of a lot of festivals around japan don't you think like the, yes some of the yeah. the danger of it is kind of part of the spectacle of the yes. event yeah yeah wow um, as amazing. long as people are not going to any uh you know horse festival where horse are quite mistreated mm -hmm. i actually think it should be fine yeah that's really <laughs> sad when you see that speaking of animals let's uh talk about cats a little bit because you uh, yeah uh, you have rescued cats and you have fostered cats you've got a yeah a passion the two, for yeah. taking care of strays right <laughs> the two cats on the picture are, uh, the big one is Musashi and the black one is Soseki. So <laughs> uh, both of them are uh, rescue cats. The first one I found him was he was uh, just a 30 gram cat. Now he's a seven kilo cat. I think it got something wrong somewhere. And the second one, Soseki, the black one, I got him from a uh, rescue center in Gifu because I wanted a companion for Musashi. And starting doing so, I uh, knew the Japan Cat Network, which is a um, volunteer network of mostly foreigners living in Japan who want to engage in, uh, you know, cat rescue or, you know, cat related content. 
Um, the cat, Japan Cat Network has two rescue centers, one in Tokyo, one in, to in Kyoto, um, and many, many, many volunteers all around Japan. And so I used to do pet sitting at my place because they used to have a big French uh, people community in Nagoya. And so people would go back to their country for one to three weeks. So at that time, I used to have a very big uh, old Japanese house in the center of Nagoya. And uh, it was absolutely free to do whatever I wanted to do with it. And so I uh, started pet sitting other people's cats. And Musashi would love so. <laughs> he's, he's super social. That's awesome. Yeah. And sweet cat. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, so you've got two, two of them. Right? I have two of them. And at the moment, I have an elderly uh, lady called, called Hibari. Um, and this uh, old lady was found in the park, a square, uh, square. Was it square? Do you say square in English? A park. Um, and she had a label on her necklace saying, I've been abandoned, please someone take me home. It was heartbreaking. It means that someone yeah. intentionally left her in the street, but still, you know, like maybe if we put something on her collar, it will, you know, diminish the cruelty of what we're doing. Um, it got me very, very angry. So the next day we got, you know, the people uh, founding her, I went to get her. And taking her directly to the vet, we found out that she has almost no teeth. She's deaf. She has problem, um, bladder problem. Um, mm. And she's probably more than 15 years old. So somebody threw out a cat in the street. They knew she would not survive. Wow. Um, I guess, you know, some... When I was talking to uh, Susan Mercer, yeah. who runs the yeah. the rescue center, and she was saying there's a lot of elderly people who, when they die, there's yeah. no one to take care of the pet. But so, actually, that's not only in Japan; that's everywhere in the world. Yeah. So sometimes there's they've lost the family connection <laughs> to have someone take care of. I mean, we don't. <laughs> Thank we don't you for the comment, Blinky Bill. I like it. Reclaim kimono and recycle <laughs> cat. <laughs> <laughs> so true but it's all about sustainability right yes. it's, it's all yes. about quality of life for animals as well as people yeah it's all, all good yeah yeah um so i'm i'm actually trying to find a forever home for hibali right now um because it's kitty season in japan and there's a lot of other cats probably needing you know for some help um but she has very very special needs and i need a family that will bring her until the end of the end of the, her life that could be in four or five years so i'm super super you know um exigent like uh and if we can't find anything she will stay at home the, the only problem is that she is uh demanding and she doesn't like musashi at all they get into oh. fights so oh, no yeah. yeah that happens you know not everybody can you know get along together yeah that's really hard well if anybody would like to adopt a cat please get yeah. in touch with real instagram um, that's the best way to contact me <laughs> instagram yeah awesome i think i've got your instagram handle here i'll show it as well but it's Thank real you. in japan all one word yeah um, you can also look for julie plus nagoya uh, that works as well to find me okay great yeah all right I, yeah yeah um, going back to sustainability and cats, um, there is a phrase from Antoine de saint exupéry who wrote, you know, like the Le Petit Prince. How do you say that in in English? What's the name of this? Uh, you know, like uh, it's a French writer. Um, he wrote a, a book that I really well known. I just don't know the name in English. But he says, "You are responsible forever of what you have tamed," and I think that goes for living things but that also goes for objects and things that you are taken under your responsibility and so it goes for taking care of your shoes it, taking care of your bread maker taking care of your car um, because it's under your responsibility and i think that's a very very uh, important point in sustainability it's okay sometimes to use plastic it's okay nobody can be perfect but just take care of things the longest you can is just ensuring that you know the systems works better so um actually my house is 
stuff, except my PC who was bought for the company, everything else is secondhand. My clothing, everything is secondhand. The kimono, the cats, uh, the boyfriend, I'm not sure, probably. <laughs> Um, but I, I'm, I'm making, actually, it's a game. Finding what I need might take more time than just going to the store and buy it. But I take a lot of fun in going, you know, to different shops and taking the time to find things. And when I find something, I always ask myself, you know, can do I really need that? And I take it or not. It doesn't mean that I'm not a minimalist. Absolutely not. But <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to take care of things I have, trying to repairing, trying to exchange them when I don't want them anymore. I uh, I have like a, a small package of everything I don't want in my house anymore. And before I do anything else, I ask all my friends if anyone needs them and I give it away. Yeah, that's the best way. Yeah. Um, quite often getting rid of stuff in Japan is very difficult. <gasps> oh um, my goodness. <laughs> and so... I, like to try to live more sustainably, I'm always really thinking about something before I buy anything new, if I yeah. have to buy something new. And if possible, like you say, try to find something secondhand. And I'm not sure about having a first time boyfriend. I, I think you would definitely want someone who's already had a, f a few. Oh, other actually, I, I, I am a several time <laughs> second handed person already yeah. myself. <laughs> Yeah, that's only for teenagers to go through. I don't I yeah. don't know about us in our in our age, a bit more mature. Um, yeah. So we've we've got about 10 more minutes. There okay. was um some of your other amazing travel I'd love to talk about. Okay. You went to the Naruto Whirlpools. Tell us about yes. that. Yes. Um that is actually uh it was a trip organized by my last company um and there was like several different places i think some people went to see red boat races and stuff and uh, i wanted some natural stuff so i pushed very hard on my company for us to have you know some natural excursion and this is truly amazing this place is incredible um, there is a bridge very, very high on between, so the main island of Japan, the Sichouishi Island, uh, sorry, the, the Honshu Island and the Awajima Island. And you cross this first bridge, you go on Awajima, and then you have a second bridge going to Shikoku, which is, um, the central south biggest island, uh, in Japan. And at that point, you have exactly um, the division. This bridge marks the division between the Seto Inner Sea, the Seto Naikai, Seto Inner Sea, and the Pacific Ocean. And actually, at that point, the Seto, the two, uh, the level of the two seas is different. Which means that each time you have, um, how do you say that? The, Shio, what's the name for this in English? Uh, you know, when the when you know, when the yeah, the salt is that the salt when you have you know, like the, the mean, water level coming in and coming out with the moon, uh, yeah, yeah, I twice I've, a day. I've also visited, um, but I went at the wrong time, so okay. I, I went when the whirlpools were not happening, so mm. I didn't realize it was connected to the tides, maybe a tidal. yeah, tides. That's tidal the word. Thing. Yeah, so it's connected to the, the to the tides, and so at so twice a day you will have the biggest, the, the highest point and the lowest point and of each one, and that can create very very big whirlpools. Um, it's it's spectacular. It's really breathtaking. So you have a huge huge for those people listening to us. There's a big bridge that is probably sixty or seventy meters up this uh, place. And inside the bridge, you have windows uh, down your feet, <laughs> and you I can actually walk on that on those windows and see that happening just between you, be, behind you, 
uh, not behind you. Under, uh, under you. Under you. Yeah. But you know, like 70 meters away. <laughs> no, it it's, is. It's amazing. It is incredible. And it's, it's really a fun natural phenomenon yeah. that I think a lot of people who visit Japan, they don't know about, right? So yeah. It's, it's I mean, everybody a... knows Naruto, the, you know, the manga, but oh, nobody man, knows where yeah. it comes from. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And you can also take a boat and go directly into the whirlpool with the boat. Um, uh, be, it's, it's okay, the boat won't sink, <laughs> but it can be very, uh, not frustrating, but like, you know, when you have like a whirlpool just opening one or two meters away, it makes the sound like a bus stop, you know, like when the, the slurping sound of, that, of the bus stop. That's wow. <laughs> very interest, interesting. That's yeah. amazing. Uh, we only have five more minutes. Okay. I would love to for you to tell us a little bit more about the kind of advice you give destinations or businesses if they want to be more sustainable. Like you often do seminars or yes. talks. What what is your you told us some of your key points? Can you tell us another kind of philosophy or key point? Um First of all is why they are doing business. What is the vision and why they want to go sustainable? That's a big question because if you want to go sustainable only to get, uh, you know, found by the government or only to get vision, like exposure on media, if you're just doing it for that, then you, the greenwashing, um, stuff is not the, the green machine sorry um also <laughs> um i mean you could be accused of greenwashing yeah um it is very important to understand that sustainability has something to do with your you are present and your fetch future and your uh, children's future and so i think that really asking you deep down why you want to do so is very important first of all um, and then make a list of what you are already doing and what you would like to do. You know, um, Japan has this uh, Toyota uh, famous concept of Kaizen. Kaizen is a word of um, continual improvement. I think that's how they translate it into English. But it's big changes are very, very difficult to implement. It takes a lot of energy, it takes a lot of money. Maybe starting on where you can act immediately and try to work from this from there um, is more interesting and it's it's easier to keep on the long run um you know before i start to uh, make my own sourdough and grow my own vegetable and rescue cats i have started a lot a lot smaller and this is all those small steps and meeting the right people connected with the same value that is making me even now taking a few more steps each week or each month. So I think that, um, you know, even if you are a company producing plastic, there's a lot of things you can do actually to um, go more sustainable. Um, there is things to be done in everywhere. And, and it's up to you to, to start somewhere. So maybe you can focus on what is your biggest waste at the moment or what is costing you the more money at the moment. If the, if the answer is human, uh, don't fire people. But, <laughs> but there is a lot of uh, different ways. Sustainability is not only about the environment. It's about sustainable lifestyle. It's about sustainable working condition. It's about, you know, uh, making life friendly for everybody and so i think the biggest question you can ask yourself is um yeah where am i not friendly at the moment or where i think i should try to do something else and maybe start there that's such a that's such a good point to think about your reasoning why yeah. why do you want to be more sustainable is it only marketing then you have to think about it a little bit more right and think yes. about um your cost where are your biggest costs uh what are the complaints from your yeah. customers um what is your long term view i think when when i talk to small business people or destinations what do you want your brand to be in 10 years in 100 years 
you know, don't only think about right now profits, right? And then I think usually the most they have the answer. Um, I mean, society and especially we don't have we only have a few seconds, but um, sustainability can all go cannot go without money because society is founded on money. So how can you make things work together and how you can make everyone happy? I mean, or try to make people that have an impact on you and or it comes to you happy is more important but it is difficult to split from money. So it has to go with it. Yeah, definitely. We need to have the income to survive, but yeah. you also need to take care of your staff and the local people to survive. And you also need to take care of the environment if you're going to survive, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, so, it's so case by case and it's yes. so... It's case by case intricate balance and yeah. connections and as long as you're thinking about it that's the good thing that's, that, yeah that's already it. a move that's already a move that's exactly <laughs> yeah. it and and there is no good or bad example everybody's different and so every solution is different and that's why it takes a lot more to accomplish because you cannot just take a model and, and do exactly the same at your place um it's like growing a vegetable you have to adapt to the soil you have or it's like fishing, you have to adapt uh, what you are putting into water to the fish you can actually catch and not only what you can, you want to catch. Um, there's a lot of adaptation going on and that takes a lot of energy. And I think that is probably the biggest break when big companies or small companies are um, you know, trying to get their business uh, model is that you need to find what works for you yeah. and only you. It's trying new ideas, researching what might work, trying it again, yeah. uh, assessing did it work or not, trying to change it, trying to improve it, yeah. uh, getting the data. It's it's a long process, right? Actually, what, this is what any company is already doing. You know, you cannot build a company without thinking about this kind of stuff. But doing this does not always ensure that you go you are sustainable. And at some point, if you cannot see it by yourself, which happens, there's a lot of professionals out there that you know can help you on trying to figure out where you could go do the, your best and, and where you you can't you know do better. There's a lot of different places, and I think that wanting to go sustainable is just basically wanting your business to continue. If you're thinking about it, yeah. Um, and, and so it can have several meanings. <laughs> yeah. And there's so many great examples in Japan and a lot of great companies, a lot of great businesses, which yeah. aren't talking about it as sustainability. They're just talking about it as it's the right thing to do. It's it's what yes. we want to do because it's meaningful. So it's it's our it's kind of our job to help them communicate what they are doing, which is good to the customer and to the locals, right? So it's yes, I mean, actually exciting. Japan is exactly the same. Is we, we do not advertise as sustainable tourism. I give myself the title sustainable tourism development specialist because people need to see that in my title. But actually what I do, I, I'm not doing it to be green or to be environmental friendly. I do it because I think this is how things should be done if we want them to continue. And my company works exactly the same. We do want to, you know, emphasize um, craftsmen and places that will benefit a lot from tourism industry, um, and and not just, you know, creating sustainable tourism for the for the the, the, um, the sake of being sustainable. And that's that's what you you know it goes with why you want to be sustainable. Is that something that is already on your lifestyle or something you want to do because it's trendy? And I think the big difference between people who do it for the trend and people who are already and people who are doing for the right thing is that people are usually already doing this. It, they're already doing it in their left lifestyle, in the way they're choosing their food, in the way they're choosing their uh, vacations and stuff. When those people are doing sustainable projects, usually it works better. Yeah, but they still need someone to help 
uh, make the connection with what good they're doing to the customer or to the potential customer. So there, there is a lot of room, I think, to develop in Japan in terms of how to communicate the good parts of what the company is doing and how to talk to the company about what they might do, which might help them improve their cost or help them improve yeah. their branding. So I think it's kind of a, it's a new concept still in Japan, but it's very, I think there's a lot of potential for growth here. So I'm very excited. I have realized that when people are going in their lifestyle to go more sustainable and more green, a lot of them, they do have the budget in mind. Um, a lot of people are, I mean, I'm on a lot of different groups for like zero waste or like fermented products or like recycling on Facebook. And most of the people, the first thing that they're advertising is how their consumption uh, like drop you know how much money they save every month and i think it's the same for company as long as they will understand that they will actually save money and get higher customer satisfaction rate and they will be able to survive longer and make more benefits then it won't be a concept to me anymore it will be the rule it will be you know like something just normal but at the moment it takes a lot of effort to change um, just a single thing and how they were doing it so far. And because the concept is still fairly new, the, the people who are trying, they're facing so many barriers at the moment. So talking about it, what you do in your lives is so important. Yeah. Yeah, just talking about it is the first big step. Just thinking about it, talking about possibilities, right? That's what this, yeah. this talk show is all about. So thank you so much, Real, for joining and Thank sharing you your questions. insights. That's awesome. Uh, the Cycle Man, what are we talking about? Please watch the replay. And Raphael Mahan, thank you so much for joining. Blinky Bill, thank you. That's Louise. my best friend. Raphael Petty <laughs> is my uh, all time best friend. So um, she probably will take time to, to watch it again. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. And yeah, please come on again and let's discuss this more. There's so much more definitely to talk about and so many more great examples yeah. to give. So yeah. thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I have a few other people if you're interested in Nagoya <laughs> to of show course. you. Please and, connect yeah. me. I want to keep keep going on this on this talk show as long as I can. Um, just to let you guys know, tomorrow, 6 p.m., um, I will be talking to, let's see if this works. This is a new notification here uh, with Bai McNeil. He's a writer in Japan, and uh, he'll be joining this talk show from here, HAPS, and to all the channels, 6 p.m. tomorrow night. We'll be talking about diversity, and he does a lot of writing about how people of color are portrayed in Japan's media. So it'll be a really interesting discussion. Please join us then. Thank you so much. That was awesome. Thank you, Julie. See you. Mata ne. Yoroshiku Thank you, everybody, for joining. Have a great night.